Hello, welcome to our show UNB Light and Lens. I am A.K. Moinuddin from United News of Bangladesh. Today we will talk about Bangladesh-Canada relations with High Commissioner to Bangladesh, His Excellency Benoit Prefontaine, who is representing his country in Bangladesh. Before going to our conversation, we will talk more about why Canada matters to Bangladesh. Canada is one of the few countries who took on the side of Bangladesh's independence from the very beginning. And this rich country is one of the top trading nations in the world which goes its own way. High Commissioner Prefontaine, thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure. You have been in Bangladesh since September 2017. So how do you view the state of relationship between Bangladesh and Canada right now? Uh, the big picture is that things are going very well. I can thank all of my predecessors who worked at the Canadian High Commission for building a really strong and, uh, and, and, and very productive relationship between our countries. I arrived uh, at the beginning of the Rohingya crisis that's playing out right now in Cox Bazar. And so this is what has dominated the early uh, two years of my, my assignment over here. Uh, and the relationship remains strong, but I would say that the focus have shifted, has shifted from bilateral issues more to the multilateral Multi issue of the Rohingya crisis. So you rightly mentioned that the relationship is now very strong between these two countries. Since you have spent almost two years in Bangladesh, what was the, actually the biggest challenge that you faced during your tenure so far? The biggest challenge for me has been to ensure that my government does not uh, forget the importance of the bilateral Bangladesh-Canada relationship because it's easy for many of my countrymen of my uh, colleagues in the government to look at all of this country through the prism of the Rohingya crisis. And there's much more that can and needs to happen between our countries aside from the Rohingya crisis. So this is how I've uh, been trying to, uh, to make a difference in reminding everyone uh, the story of Bangladesh, it's not just the Rohingya, there are so many other things happening in this country. Yes, uh, you are right that the, the relationship is not just confined within the Rohingya issue. There is something beyond this, you said. So I just uh, would like to know whether you are expecting something uh, in the coming year in terms of the crisis, whether we are going to find a solution to this crisis. I think that uh, the Rohingya are unlikely to move in a large numbers back to Myanmar because as we hear all the time, the conditions just are not conducive to a safe, dignified, voluntary return. And so, uh, you know, I think this is going to take time. Mm -hmm. And we have to be realistic and try to factor in the fact that the Rohingya, most of them, if not the vast majority, will remain in Bangladesh for a long time and we need to take care of them to empower them while they're here waiting to go home. Yes, I cannot disagree with you as you said uh, it will take time. But uh, since Myanmar is not listening to anybody actually, the entire international community is putting pressure on Myanmar to take back their nationals from Bangladesh, but still they are not listening to anybody. Actually, what's the solution actually? What do you think? Well, it's often been said that the, the solution is in Myanmar. Right. I'm not a Myanmar expert. Right. Um, what I do think though that's uh, an important starting point is that this is a genocide. A genocide doesn't happen in one week. It gets built up over a long time, right. including uh, in the way the population of Myanmar over years and decades have been taught or told that the Rohingya don't belong there. And this will take time to undo. And it has to come from within Myanmar, not from the international community that the, the Rohingya belong in Rakhine. And this is why it will take time, I'm afraid, before it is safe for the Rohingya to go home. 
moving to trade issues between our two countries. So far we know you have appointed a trade commissioner to explore more opportunities in, wow. on trade front actually. Uh, what is the progress so far you have seen? Well, well thanks for bringing it up. This is an area that uh, I find exciting. I know that uh, for many Bangladeshi, uh, especially young people, there's a big fear that there won't be jobs for them, that there's growth in the country but without jobs. And so when, uh, when I look at uh, what can Canada do to support continued economic growth, creation of jobs, I quickly come to the conclusion that there has to be private sector-led development in your country, and that will require investment, it will require more trade, and this is what we're trying to do. You're absolutely right, for the first time ever, our High Commission in Bangladesh has a trade commissioner, a senior trade commissioner, who spends all of her time speaking with Canadian companies about doing business here, about investing here, about finding Bangladeshi partners, about bringing technology. And also part of her work has to do with education uh, and uh, skills development and Canadian curricula that would be useful in Bangladesh. So this is an area where we're increasingly active and to answer your question, uh, we are seeing results already. Um, in 2019, for the first time ever, Canadian exports to Bangladesh have passed the $1 billion mm -hmm. mark. Uh, this is significant for us. It means that in South and Southeast Asia, Bangladesh is now one of the major markets for Canadian food, for example aircraft, so a few areas where we've been successful. And what we think now is that it's necessary to broaden to new sectors, to have more investment, more joint ventures. And uh, this, I think, is what will be the most mutually beneficial for both our countries. Bangladesh uh, is also quite active in Canada. Mm -hmm. and uh, record exports, all-time exports from Bangladesh to Canada. Um, so both our countries are in record territory this year. It's the best year ever. And, uh, and I think this is the beginning of a positive trend that will continue. Excellency, you mentioned about some new areas that you want to explore in the coming days. What are the actually potential areas that Canadian investors can look into? Well, uh, my personal area that I'm uh, trying very hard to promote in Canada is uh, find more tie-ups between Canadian and Bangladeshi education institutions. I think there's a big need in this country um, for uh, advanced skills, uh, new curricula, not just for PhD students or bachelor's degree in traditional university areas. I think in many technical disciplines, Canadian colleges would be able to come here and help to educate a lot of workers who would immediately find work in Bangladesh industry. And unless there's enough of these skilled workers, it will become a break on investment in your country. Right. So, so I think Bangladesh needs two things to be able to create more jobs and continue to grow. One is skilled workers. The second one is infrastructure. I think there's a lack of infrastructure which is slowing down Bangladesh's ability to, uh, to grow, to develop, to industrialize. And infrastructure doesn't mean just power or gas connections. It also means roads, railways, uh, airports, everything needed to move products, to move people. It's, it's, a, big, uh, it's a big area that uh, I think some Canadian companies would eventually be able to play a role in accelerating. We understand uh, there have been some achievement during your tenure over the last two years. Uh, is there any unfinished task since uh, you will be leaving shortly, if I am correct? Well, um, I'm not sure when I'll be leaving. 
uh, but uh, it could be as soon as uh, uh, September 2020. Um, what I'm trying to do in the, in the next uh, six to eight months while I'm still here is to work on the education front. This, I think, could become the pillar of the Canada-Bangladesh relationship. Uh, many students are going to Canada right now to study record numbers. Uh, one of the top destinations for Bangladeshi students who can afford to go study overseas. I know that many of them will then be able to work in Canada, start their careers, gain experience. Some of them will also become Canadian citizens and this will make it easier for Canadian companies who come here to find uh, people who know about Canada, who've been trained in Canada and who can help uh, introduce Canadian companies to this market which isn't very well known in Canada. When I talk about education, I also always think about the need to have a two-way street. Right. I want Canadian researchers to come and work with Bangladesh universities who do research. I would like to see student exchange programs so Canadian students can come and spend a semester, a year, or even get a whole uh, a whole uh, undergraduate degree in Bangladesh eventually. So you are talking about kind of collaboration with Bangladesh University? Absolutely. So this is uh, the kind of uh, linkages that I'm encouraging and I'm trying to introduce uh, Canadian to Bangladeshi academics and universities to universities, colleges to colleges. And I'm hoping that I will have enough time to get something concrete going on. People to people contact is very important in our relations, in any bilateral relations, I think. Mm -hmm. What's your plan to further strengthen this people to people contact and cultural ties between Bangladesh and Canada? Mm -hmm. No, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it's vital to have more, uh, more movement between our two countries and more people to people contact. Um, you know, there are a few positive things that happened recently. Um, in October 2019, the Government of Canada lifted the travel advisory, which right. had been in place since the Holy Artisan Bakery right. uh, tragedy, which, uh, well, uh, pretty much uh, made it uh, almost impossible for Canadian companies or universities to send their employees to Bangladesh or for tourists to come here. Uh, so we had the uh, instructions to avoid Bangladesh for non-essential travel. This has now been lifted. The gates are open, Canadians can come here, companies can send their employees. So I expect uh, a large increase. Likewise, I'm hoping there will continue to be more Bangladeshis visiting Canada, whether it's to study, to work, to immigrate, to, as tourists, to visit their relatives. I think uh, movement of people is important and has to continue to increase. I'd like to go back to Rohingya issue again before conclusion. Yes. There was a hearing at the UN, top UN court, International Court of Justice, uh, a case filed against Myanmar on genocide. Mm. And so far we understand Canada remains very supportive to this process, especially on accountability and justice front. What's your expectation? regarding the provisional measures that would like, I mean, uh, that we are expecting. I think there's a strong case that was put forward uh, in a unanimous resolution in the Canadian Parliament, supported by every elected official, has already uh, found that we consider that what happened in, September, in uh, August 2017 was a genocide. Uh, however, that's just our own parliament, our own government. We will respect the decisions of the International Court of Justice and other, other international bodies or any efforts to try to help the Rohingya um, and, and resolve the very difficult situation they are in. So Canada, very supportive of the Rohingya and also uh, feels a lot of solidarity with the government of Bangladesh, which is the government on the front line who has 
the burden, financial and uh, ecological and all that, of having to host such a huge population of refugees. Uh, and so a lot of solidarity with the government of Bangladesh. And at the same time, doing whatever we can to help the Rohingya obtain justice. Do you have any specific plan for the host community? Uh, you know, this is uh, an area where we are gradually working with all our partners and the NGOs, but also with the local communities uh, over there to try to mitigate the negative impacts of having so many Rohingya. Um, we, uh, we understand that uh, the government of Bangladesh has reasons why they are doing what they are doing to preserve the security in Cox Bazar, and uh, radicalization risks and all that. Uh, but we uh, are trying to do our best to ensure that both the host communities uh, around the camps and the Rohingya community inside the camps can live side by side in harmony, help each other, and uh, during the years that it might take to resolve this, do the best of a difficult situation, and we'll be there to help both these communities. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and listen to you. Thank you very much for Thank accepting our much. invitation. Thank you for watching this episode. We'll be back again with another guest in the coming weeks. Thank you.